Hi, my name is Thaddeus Aid. I'm a member of the Department of Statistics at the University of Oxford, and I'm also a lecturer in programming languages at the um, IT department's uh, learning program. Um, so what this is, is it's a section of a uh, series of supplemental um, videos um, to go along with my introduction to Python course. Um, so I'm putting this up here, one, to help my students, and two, just to put it up as a general public resource so everybody can, can take a look if you want to learn how to uh, program in Python, or if you're just looking to sort of get an idea of what code is, uh, welcome to the course. All right. So for Oxford students, um, the course length is six weeks. Um, it's an online self-paced learning with instructor insistence. Um, basically, if you're coming in from Oxford, um, I'm available to help uh, answer questions and help um, you understand concepts. If you're a um, member of the general public, um, uh, there are plenty of online resources, um, or you can leave a comment on one of the videos, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Um, so I estimate about five hours per week in in coursework um, for my Oxford students. Um, the public can you do this as and when they they wish. Um, and again, for the Oxford students, um, I I do have kind of an online uh, presence expectation, um, and I want you to get involved in the WebLearn community. Um, you will have been given the address and login details for that previously. So Python, I think, is the best language to start learning how to program in. It, it's really easy to learn. Um, it, deal, it gets rid of a lot of the problems that um, trip up new programmers when they start with some other languages, like sort of the classic C or, or with Java. Um, and what Python is, it's a high level language, uh, which means it's easier for humans to read and understand. Um, and this is kind of in contrast to the original programming languages, uh, which were very low level, very close to the, the computer itself, very uh, very close to how the computer actually works. And these, these older languages, um, like the assembly languages, um, required that you uh, use very un inhuman or not human uh, ways of communicating with the computer. Um, so that wasn't very easy to do. So a lot of people started working on the higher level languages, which allows us to easily interact with the computer and tell it what to do. So interpreted, again, I, I kind of like to compare this to the older compiled languages. Uh, so a compiled language um, takes the code and it turns it into a very specific uh, program that you will generally use. Uh, most of the programs that you have used are compiled um, so things like like Internet Explorer, or Chrome, or Windows itself, or Linux, or or Mac OS, these are all compiled programs. So they're they're preset into what they do, and to make any changes to the program, you have to change the the program, recompile it, and put it back out. However, an interpreted language, um, or sometimes called scripting languages, um, allow you. Well, every time it's run, the computer goes through and translates it from the code and puts it into um, the computer language so that it can um, run and, and execute. However, what this means is that it's really easy to go back and change these scripts and, and change these interpreted languages at any time that you want, because all you have to do is go in and change the, the file itself. And then next time you run it, it, it will make all the changes. So Python is um, what is called a Turing complete language. Um, it's general purpose. It can do anything that a computer can do. Um, computers are, of course, limited because um, of what they are. Um, but Python can do pretty much anything and it has. So alternatives to Python, um, well, there's Perl. Um, for those watching on YouTube on this channel, I also have um, an older set of lectures about the introduction to Perl. Um, Perl was kind of introduced uh, about the same time as the internet. And because it's also an interpreted language, um, it became very useful for systems administrators to be able to get through and process large amounts of textual data. Um, so it became very popular with um, systems admins, and it became very popular um, for web programming, because you could make the changes as you needed to.
If you're looking for something more for pure mathematics or, or pure uh, statistics, um, MATLAB and R are very good alternatives. Um, both of them are, again, um, interpreted languages um, so that you can make the changes that you need to. Um, but they're a little bit more robust for this particular, um, this particular um, uses. If you have a large program that's going to be executing many, many times and you need to have it be as fast as possible, um, I might recommend one of the compiled languages or one of the just-in-time compiled languages. Um, the problem with the interpreted languages is because they are reinterpreted into machine language every time that you run it, there's a, there's a, you can't optimize it as much as you can one of the compiled languages. So if if quick execution is of paramount importance, you might want to try C or C++ or, or Java. So in this video lecture series, um, I'll be doing a general introduction into what programming is, what an algorithm is, what a variable is, um, to get you sort of on board with, with what we're going to be doing for, for the rest of the course. Um, we'll be doing simple Python data, um, where we'll be introduced to a couple of uh, variable types. Um, we'll do a quick talk about debugging. Uh, one of the things that you have to understand is that um, even experienced programmers um, can continue to make mistakes either in typos or just um, forgetting what the, or not quite getting what the algorithm actually wants to do. So learning how to debug your programs is a very vital step in becoming a programmer. Um, then we will be introduced to Python turtle graphics. It's a great way to start working with other people's code and um, to get an idea of how objects work and how functions work. Um, then we'll talk about Python modules, which are libraries of other people's code that you can import into your program um, and just use. Then we'll talk about functions. So one of the big things about computer science is that we like to reuse stuff. Um, we we don't want to have to keep writing new thing or keep writing the same thing in multiple places. So what we do is we put them in self-contained little um, little idea packages um, and we call these functions. And so that we, we have a, cent a central place that will do something for us many, many times and we can call it from different parts of a program. Of course, up to here where we're doing um, everything sort of in a, in a later linear process where we start at the beginning and move to the end, but that's not hugely useful. What we want to be able to do is we want to be able to make choices as we, we do our programming. Um, and this is where selection comes in. So we can start to make choices between um, how we want the program to run. Now, of course, the other thing that computers are great at is that they do the same thing billions of times. And so we, we'll start talking about iteration uh, because we're going to want to do the same things again and again and again, and we don't want to do it by hand because that sucks. Um, then, OK, so strings are a special data type um, that contains characters, um, and there are a bunch of built-in functions that you can do to process strings because a lot of uh, what people people do with the programming languages is deal with strings and deal with um, real language data. Um, a list is a collection of different types of objects. Um, it could be um, a, several different strings that are all logically connected together in some way. Of course, we don't want to have to enter all of our data at every, th um, every time we run a program. So we um, often store data into files, either input data or output data, so that we can do something else with it if we, as we need to. A dictionary is another um, collection object that allows you to associate um, some sort of name with, with some data. Um, recursion is a little bit more advanced of a topic where you call a function and then call that function from within with inside of itself so that you can break big problems down into small problems and small, solve the small problems. And finally, we will um, uh, cover the, object, uh, the topic of object-oriented programming, um, which is a way to see the world um, and makes it much easier to sort of conceptually uh, put your programs together. Um, so for Oxford students, um, I have a general expectation that you cover about two to three chapters per week. Um, one post on WebLearn, two replies to WebLearn. Um, these are guidelines, um, although I really do encourage everybody to start talking to each other. Um, again, for Oxford students, um, uh, there are specific assignments that you'll need to do each week. Um, the 
most important one is the last one because that's uh, the one that I decide whether or not you pass the course or not. Um, but the first week we'll be building an algorithm of your favorite meal. There's no programming involved in this. Um, I just want you to start thinking about how to break tasks up into small achievable goals. Then we'll build a min-max function. Um, then we'll use the min-max function as part of our bubble sort org um, function. Then we'll build on bubble sort to do a binary search algorithm. Then we'll um, take all of that, put it into a bigger program um, that will save, retrieve, use in user input in some way. And then finally, we will um, take that program and we will modify it to work with object-oriented design. Um, so to do this course, there is a companion book, which is here at interactivepython.org. It's a great book. Um, it allows you to um, read and do the exercises inside your web browser. It, that's absolutely fantastic. Um, so you'll be able to take a look at the code as you need to, um, and then we can change things. So if we wanted to um, change the number of turtles in that example to five, Uh, we can just change it in the thing and then it, it, it'll change. Um, again, we can change that to like 15, run it again. Um, so it allows you to do everything that all the programming tasks that the, the book expects you to do inside the book itself, which is fabulous. But then when you want to start working in Python itself, um, what you're going to want to do is go to python.org slash downloads and download uh, Python 3.4.3 three or whatever the latest version is. Um, if you've got legacy problems and the um, environment that you're going to be coding for supports Python 2, then you're going to want to get 2. But you should probably start with Python 3 going forward because this is the future of the language. Um, I've already downloaded it, but and I'll show you how to install it. Uh, so it's just a simple install. Um, I've already got it um, installed, so we'll we'll just uh, repair. This is the boring bit, having to install everything. Um, so yeah. Um, anyway, uh, there is a link here about the differences between Python two and three. That's uh, probably a good thing to take a look at. Um, there we go. We are all sorted on that. Um, so then that gives us something called idle, which is a integrated development environment um, that allows you to um, have some help programming the language. Um, the interactive shell here that we're looking at um, is basically a fancy calculator at this point for you. I mean, we can type things like 3 plus 4 and it'll tell us it's a 7. We can save that into a variable for later usage. We can access that variable. Um, and it can do all sorts of just simple math for you at the moment. Uh, sort of importantly, it allows us to build script files that we'll be working with later. Um, alternately, if you don't want to use idle, um, I recommend the Eclipse um, IDE. And what you'll need to do for that is you'll need to download and install the um, Java development kit. Um, so grab the latest one. You have to accept the license first, then download your appropriate type. Um, I'm Windows 64, uh, Windows 64 bit. All right, so to install um, Java, you just go like this, install. Again, it's a boring bit. Um, you can just um, accept all all the default installation information and everything will be fine. Of course, you can change the, the install path if you wish. It's entirely up to you. And there we go. And so now we go to... Oh, now we extract. I'm going to extract this to the my J drive. You can put it wherever you want to. Um, 
All right, now let's go and take a look at this. So, okay, so what you need to do is you need to set yourself up a workspace, and I'm going to again change this to my D drive. Um, again, you can put it wherever you want. Um, you can either use it as default or not. I tend to use just one workspace and put everything into it. I'm a little bit sloppy like that. Um, but using multiple workspaces allows you to sort of logically segment different uh, projects into, into different um, spaces. Now to get Python working in Eclipse, um, we need to install a um, an add-on, and the one that we're going to want to do is PyDev. Uh, again, another boring bit. Sorry about this. All right. So what we want is PyDev. Click the install button. Um, it'll take a moment to um, make sure that everything that it needs is set up. Um, install everything for that. Confirm. Uh, accept the license agreement. It'll download everything. Um, it'll warn you that you're installing unsigned con content, but that's fine. Restart Eclipse. Go to the workbench, and now you'll be able to um, change everything so that you're you're now working in a. Python development environment, and uh, we'll start using that in the next video. Um, so thanks for bearing with me. Um, please like and share and uh, subscribe, and I will see you next time. All right, bye.